Welcome to No Password Required, a monthly conversation that introduces you to some of the top talent in the world of cybersecurity. Hello and welcome to No Password Required, a podcast dedicated to exploring the minds and personalities that make up the field of cybersecurity. I'm your host, Ernie Ferraresso, and with me as always, Jack Clavy, a cybersecurity attorney at Carlton Fields, PA in Tampa. On the podcast today, we will chat with General Frank McKenzie, the Executive Director of the Global and National Security Institute at the University of South Florida and Executive Director of Cyber Florida. General McKenzie was promoted to the grade of general and assumed command of Central Command in March 2019. He relinquished command of CENTCOM and retired from the Marine Corps on April 1, 2022, after completing over 42 years of service. General McKenzie, we look forward to a great conversation. But first, Hello to my co-host, Jack Clabby. Jack, how are you, sir? I'm doing great today, Ernie. I'm doing great today. Everything okay with you? You know, not too bad. But I will tell you this, Jack. I am a little concerned about you. I, I'm, uh, I'm not going to lie. Because uh, uh, for those who don't know, ran into Jack this weekend, this past weekend, uh, at a sporting event. Uh, and, uh, you know, we said our pleasantries, hello. And then, uh, you know, we parted ways, a crowded event. Jack wanted to get in touch with me. So how does he do it? I'm telling you. He sends me an email to my work email. And so, Jack, I'm concerned that you, you, you're you not paying attention to your proper work-life balance. So That's for some reason, I didn't have I didn't have your mobile phone in my phone. I I think I had had it in my in my uh, like I just not saved it to the same place. It was where, in your burner I phone. I get it. Yeah. You, you know how those things grow yeah, exactly. yeah, with with our with your background. So yeah. we're um, so I did the only way I could reach you was I thought, okay, I, I know his, his email address. So I sent you an email trying to just locate you. And I would have thought, right, that you would have had your finger on the pulse of all cybersecurity goings on and been ready, been ready to go there. But either way, a good day was had uh, out on the, uh, out on the, uh, the bypass canal, watching, yes. some, watching some rowing. Exactly. exactly. Which is great. And it's one of the, it's a great sport for kids because it's one of the few sports where you absolutely cannot have a digital device with you. When you're out on the water, <laughs> exactly. Just... That's exactly correct. Exactly, <laughs> unless you got a heck of a good insurance plan, and yeah, you know, that's I'm not doing yeah. that. <laughs> you're on a razor's edge of at any point, the any moment, over. any moment. Um, but that's one of the great rowing is one of the great Florida sports because we can be in the water, you know, and all the all the kids can be in the water uh, uh, twelve months out of the year, which is a, yeah. a ton of fun. And you know, it does. Um, it is something that we're going to be talking to the general today. That you know, I think. Uh, uh, a lot of the military academies have, right? Because yeah. it does have sort of a martial history associated with it. Um, but we've been thinking, you know, thinking about the general coming today, I was thinking about what impact it can have on an organization when someone with, with military leadership training comes into the organization, right? A lot of the workforce readiness program that's happening here in Florida is, you know, doing exactly mm -hmm. that, Ernie, where you're, you're taking somebody with, with military training, often military leadership training, putting them in the private or the public sector, you know, what are some of the things, you know, what are some of the challenges and benefits of, of that from, from your perspective? Yeah, I would tell you, part of uh, the thing that, that I found, I don't want to say difficult, but most, most interesting and, and, and challenging is, the, first off, it, a lot of the, mis, uh, the misperceptions on what being in the military is like. So if you're coming into an organization, you know, people tend to have a, uh, they, 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 they seem to think you're going to act a certain way. Uh, okay. That that you have a certain there's there's a certain you know movie esque way that you're going to do with it, uh, and then I also think on the other side that you also you know coming in from the military you're getting people oftentimes will tell you oh yeah well you're going to have to adapt to this there's places people are going to tell you oh we're just not going to do that and it's not yeah. and we, you can't tell me what to do <laughs> and so you, you as if. Uh, that's what you, that's like the first thing you're going to do is you're going to just walk in here and say, you go do this and go pick up that. And, and uh, so it's, it's kind of, it's that when things come together, it's trying okay. to, uh, that, that's where you start to, you've got that first, I'll call it a transition period when you're going into that new job. So your first okay. job is really uh, challenging in that is, is bringing that together. But what I, what I do think ends up happening um you know, for those that that uh, that are are successful and really, uh, you know, I'll call it leaping out into the into the private sector world, is, is identifying what are the um, uh, what are the really the, the really good things 
or the applicable things that the, that the that being in the military provides. I think it's uh, perspective on a lot of things uh, because generally speaking, uh, in the military, a lot of the the areas where you're dealing with and the things that you're doing have uh, some pretty broad comp- consequences beyond uh, just I'll call it financial. Um, if you're if you're in the business community, you know, you, you, that type of thing, uh, you know, if something doesn't go right, you bad things can happen to, yeah. uh, you know, so there, there, there's that. So that kind of puts a lot of things into perspective. Kind of, you know, I talk, a, uh, the way I think about it is, uh, you know, particularly in, you know, in, in, in the field in where I am, it's, uh, I like to remind people, okay, nothing that we do or don't do today is going to result in somebody dying. So, you know, they ca- kind of keep that yeah. in mind, but then also the, uh, I think the, you're also exposed to, uh, especially as you get further along, a, a, a broad range of different situations and different, uh, different styles and people. Uh, just because of the nature of it, if you do more than one assignment, you're moved around uh, basically at least every three years. So every three years, you're starting a new job. So you kind of have that experience of, okay, I'm going to someplace new. How do yeah. I start over? And I, that was one of the things that I, that was, uh, that I didn't realize was that was, was exactly that. Cause my sister started a new job uh, in, I guess a couple, couple, three years ago. And she was, you know, practically panicked about going to this new job. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what, what's the big deal? I mean, you just go and you do this. And, and then it dawned on me, this was the second time that she had done this. And she's, you know, oh, she's in her thirties, right? Yeah. So that, okay. that was that, that side of it. But I, I think it's been, uh, there's a lot of good things, but the, you know. I like that as a counterintuitive, you know, for, for hiring folks out there thinking, thinking that hiring someone from the military would be rigid, that it's the opposite of that yeah. because they, they're forced adaptability. That they, you know, if someone's been in the service for, you know, more than six years, they've had at least two jobs and often yep. in two locations, if not many more than that. Um, and that's, I like that way of thinking about it. And that's yeah. something we've certainly see with our veterans who work for us, both as, both as attorneys and, and as, as staff um, hires. What, one thing I do want to mention, you know, as we think about leadership today, um, I, re, I, I was on an airplane uh, a couple of days ago. It was like, this was last week, Thursday and Friday, and they had a it was, you know, before the holiday. And so it ha- they had a selection of Christmas movies. This was on the United flight back from New York. Uh-huh. to Tampa. Yes. Yes. And I'm clicking on Christmas movies. And what do I see as a Christmas movie? Not Die Hard. We've, we've talked about this, yeah. I think, on the program before. Yeah. But I also saw Gremlins. Really? Gremlins is a Christmas movie. I'd completely forgotten the Mowgli that is the gift to the boy. To, to That's the, right. It all adult. starts. He's not even a boy. He's actually graduated and he's working at a bank. I'd forgotten about that, too. He gets this as a gift from his dad, who was an inventor, uh, at Christmas for Christmas. It's his gift. And that starts the whole adventure that happens. Now, one other thing that, if you remember, the, when they turn, um, the spoiler alert, right? The yeah, well, yeah, turn. yeah, yeah. I, th- I think I think we get the, it's like having antique plates on a car. At yes. that time, think you, you, yeah, if we're going to tell you about it. You, yeah. 25 years. I think right. it was an 84 or an 86 yep. movie, mid 80s movie. So, Early on, when the Mowgli replicates, one of them has the stripe down the head. Yes. Says, oh, the one with the stripe down the head seems to be the leader. And then that later on, it's a little foreshadowing, I believe, is the director's technique there, uh, becomes a leader later on. And so that that kind of was a, it was not a taught leadership. It was an innate leadership, which I, I don't necessarily agree with. I I'm, mean, maybe I'm, the military would not agree with that either. No, I, yeah, no, I, I think you're, you're correct on, uh, on two points. First, I do believe that, uh, yeah, leadership is something, uh, that, that can be taught. And it's, it's a question of, uh, enabling, uh, as a, as a good leader and building other leaders is making sure that the, the people are in the right place that you put the, you put them in situations yeah. for them to, to succeed and, and they can grow in that. And secondly, perhaps more important that, yes, I would agree that, <laughs> uh, gremlins is in fact a Christmas movie because of the way you just describe it, that the entire movie does not happen unless yeah. he receives this gift at Christmas. That's right. And, and I, I want to say that it has to take place in the wintertime. It did all of those things oh, yeah. play into it. There's snow, there's yep. a car that won't start. Yep. Um, Corey Feldman at one point as a young man, very, as a kid, he's dressed up like a Christmas tree in a disguise. Yep. Um, but it has a great, has a fantastic, so I, I, I got through maybe the first half and now I have to finish the second half because the, the flight ended, but there was a, um, a great eighties trope, which you don't see anymore where they want to figure out what's going on. They don't go to the government or the police. 
they go the to internet, the science. Oh no, the internet. They're, they're, yeah. it's not here. They yeah. go to the science teacher. So a kid who has graduated walks into a high school, finds his old science teacher, and asks the science teacher to run some experiments. See, which the high school science teacher amazing. exactly. Well, which is awesome. I mean, I'm sure yeah. if you went and did enough, science teacher would be really excited about it, but you don't see it in the, it was like, that was like a great eighties thing. Like the you science teacher is going to open up the else. laboratory and run some tests for a couple of kids who graduated a year ago. Like wow. it's, it's bananas, but it's a great little segment. There was the, speaking of that of uh, was uh, what was the name of it? It was one of these movies where it was about, I, I don't know if it was time travel or something, but that's what it, what it, they, <laughs> somebody had found one of the kids, they had graduated they went to the yeah. junkyard and they had found some device uh, and they didn't know what it was. And they turned it on and it turned out it was like a, it was a time, a time travel. And it was Love bringing it. parts like dinosaurs and things back. And where did they go to, to find <laughs> answers? They went back to their old high school because, awesome. you know, who helped Mr. Johansson. He'll know how to do, right. deal with this. And. Of course, and you see, yeah, yeah, you see it on uh, Stranger Things too. There's, yeah. a, you know, because the, the the AV, he's like awesome, right? The, he's helping the kids in a real way. So, I think science teachers now who are listening to this, yes, you know, you got to write some angry letters to Hollywood and say we need to improve. Bring we go back. back to the '80s. You guys were like the leading, you know, you were like in the town. You were the repository of science knowledge. And exactly, your, your doors were open. So. If there was, if there was some cataclysmic disaster, awesome. Yeah, who did they call? Yeah. The science teacher. Yeah, go down there and do it. Even yeah. when the gremlins start to start to have problems. So yeah. it doesn't work out, you know. No, yeah. I, I won't go all the way on it because I, I forget what happens in the second half, but that's, that's yeah, my won't, report. I won't, won't ruin it too much for you. Gremlins is a Christmas movie. It has half the cast of Fast Times from uh, uh, at Ridgemont High in it. Surprise. <laughs> I was also surprised by that. <laughs> but a good one. Anyway, that's our that's our PSA for, for movies to watch. We may but, have. There you go. Gremlins. For your, put them on your holiday list right after... Uh... Right after Christmas vacation, but tee up gremlins. And with that said, we're going to take a quick break. And when we return, we're going to talk to General Frank McKenzie about his leadership style and how it's evolved over time. And we may delve into some uh, discussions about, uh, I don't know, 80s movies and such. So stick around. Looking for more no password required content? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at No Password Pod. All right, welcome back. Our guest is General Frank McKenzie, the Executive Director of the Global and National Security Institute and the Executive Director here at Cyber Florida. General McKenzie, welcome to No Password Required. Ernie, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm particularly glad that I don't need a password to be aboard. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> but we do have other ways of verifying identity around here, but we'll get to that later on. <laughs> Uh, General, can you tell us a little bit about your career path? I mean, it's familiar to to a lot of us, but maybe not to our listeners. And you know, how did you get started? And uh, you know, how did that path lead you to where you are now with your positions at USF and Cyber Florida? Sure. So I was very lucky to have uh, forty two years, ten months, and three days on active duty in the United States Marine Corps. And when I started back in May of nineteen seventy nine, I had no idea that my career would last that long or that I would end up as a four-star officer in command of the United States Central Command. You know, I, I went into the Marine Corps because I, uh, I found it to be a challenge. Um, you know, I'd always been interested in being a Marine, even before I went to the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina. Uh, I had a desire to, 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 to pursue a commission in the Marine Corps. So that sort of stayed steady with me. Um, so I knew that I wanted to do that. I knew I wanted to be an infantry, an infantry officer. Uh, I knew I wanted to deploy. I knew I wanted to go forward. And, and, and so I, and really, I think after I got to the Citadel, the thing that further attracted me to the Marine Corps was the people. And if there's one theme really that's carried on and why you hang around an organization for over four decades, it's the people that you meet. The men and the women that, uh, that, that are in the United States Marine Corps are fantastic. And so I've had the opportunity to be led by them and to lead them over the course of a very long and, and rewarding career, doing a lot of different things. I mean, I started off as an infantry officer. I was eventually trained to have another job as a tank officer, uh, a secondary, what we call a secondary military occupational specialty. And then over time, I began to work more in the strategy and the policy realm and introduced to that up in, up in the national capital region up in DC, where I was exposed to that. So all of those things over time, you know, your career sort of flowers. And, uh, 
and luck and opportunity came together and I was able to stay around for a very long time. But I'll tell you, the, the day I left the Marine Corps, uh, I was just as energetic about being a Marine as the day I entered the Marine Corps. <laughs> the day talking to you, I love the Marine Corps just as much and regard that experience just as rewarding as any day on active duty. Could not have been a better experience for me. How do you keep that up? Like, how do you maintain that? What's What drives that? Well, I, I'll tell you, part of it is, um, you know, you, you just... You have, you have designs on what you want to do. You know, what's the big picture? What do you want to do? I never, when I came in the Marine Corps, I never thought about, about being a general or doing anything like that. I thought about being a good platoon commander, being a good company commander, doing as good as I could with the, uh, with the jobs that I was given and, you know, and, and, and maximizing the opportunities for those people that work for me. So I sort of focused on that. And so what you do is you deal with the job that you got. You know, you don't worry about the things you can't control. What you do, though, is you, you, in fact, worry a lot about the things that you can control. That's what you want to. And, and so having knowing how to divide those two, some things you can tilt at a will, you know, you can tilt against a windmill forever and it's not going to change. So you need to understand what those things are and you need to you need to understand what are the things that you can have an effect on. And that's where you need to spend your energy. And over time, as you mature, your planning horizon goes out. And you think to yourself, where do I want to be in five years? You know, what, I want my, what do I want my family to be doing in five years? And in the Marine Corps, what kind of job do I want to have in five years? And so over time, as you, as you go a little older, you don't think about that as a brand new Marine lieutenant. But by the time you're a captain or a major, you begin to think about those things. And then so that's sort of how, how it sort of worked out for me. Over time, I think I matured, but I always tried to do the very best at the thing I was doing. And not worry, again, not worry about the things you can't, you can't influence or control. And how did you, uh, General, how did you connect with USF? How did that process come about? So this is, you know, I've lived in Tampa three times. I lived in Tampa from 2010 to 2012 as the J-5, the planner for U.S. Central Command. Came back in 2013, 2014 to be the, uh, to be the commander of all Marine forces in the Middle East as a three-star job. Then, I, of course, I came back the third time in 2019 uh, to be the Central Command commander as a four-star officer. Over that period of time, I got to know uh, Rio Law, and we, we got to know each other socially. Great. We found that we enjoyed each other's company, and I developed a great respect for her. And so as I, as, as I began to look at what I was going to do after I left active duty, um, she talked to me about possibly coming up here and doing some work at USF. Uh, I didn't know a whole lot about USF, except they beat Auburn, the team I follow in college football. <laughs> you know, I do remember that. And, uh, and I remember that they had some glory days in football in, in the past, but I didn't know a whole lot more about USF, but I got to know Rhea real well. And uh, I, I got to tell you, I think the university has hit a home run with her as the president. She is a strong leader. She's not afraid to make decisions. She listens to input. She knows people, takes care of people. And, you know, I keep coming back to the theme of people. It really is all about people. So she, she, we talked about doing something up here. I had an opportunity to do a little, in, a little investigation. And then when I did begin to work up here, I was just, again, impressed with the people. There's a lot of energy at USF. It's a new institution. It's not bound by ancient rules and laws of the past that affect some institutions of higher learning, but it's focused on the future. And it's not afraid to take risks and look bravely into the future. So, hey, that's an organization I want to be associated yeah. with. So it was a great fit. I, I look forward to coming to work every day up here. I got to tell you, the USF football is awesome. And a lot of people go to it. But one of the best kept secrets, if it's even a secret anymore in the Tampa Bay area, is USF basketball. Yes. Because it's a great place to see a game. And they have outstanding competition and they have a good team. So you know, I even went at times during the pandemic and just thought, you know, this is amazing when they would let us go. So it was just a really, a really special place and a great place to, to spend time. So in all your roles, I mean, from the beginning um, as a lieutenant through to today, you've been leading people. General, how would you describe your, your leadership style and has it changed um, over time? Well, sure. So it certainly has matured. What I did as a captain or a lieutenant colonel is not how you, how you behave as a, as a, as a, as a general. Uh, you know, so when you're a young officer uh, commanding a rifle platoon or a rifle company, you got to be the best person in that unit at doing all the soldier skills. You got to you got to know how to break a weapon down. You got to know how to make operate that weapon. You got to be very you got to be strong, very physical. All those things you have to be able to do because the, the Marines down there they're looking at they're looking at you. So you got to do that. 
as you get older, and so you're and you're dealing with units of 30 Marines and 120, 150 Marines in a rifle company. But as you get older and you accept positions of greater responsibility, you're no longer directly affecting individual Marines. Instead, your subordinates or the are those lieutenant colonels and colonels who command the Marines. So you're really working, you're now working with a group of older and more mature Marines. So your leadership has got to change a little bit. It's got to become, you've got to be able to articulate why you want to do things. Although I will say this with Marines and soldiers, in fact, with any American uh, fighting man or woman, uh, they want to know why they're doing something. Yeah. You can't just tell them to do it. That, and that's the strength of the United States. They, nobody does things blindly in the U.S. military. That's a common, yeah. perhaps a common misconception. It's certainly a misconception. But the truth of the matter is, if you want to get, and it's not Generation X, Generation Y, Generation Z, don't know much about that. I do know that they're not markedly different from, say, the people that went off to the Second World War. Yeah. And that you've got to convince them that what they're doing is the right thing to do if they're going to put the, their life on the line. And what you as a commander have got to do is you've got to say, hey, we're going to go in, we're going to do this job. And what I promise you is I'll have the best possible plan to go in and do that job and to get as many of you back out as I can. And that's what a commander does. That's what he or she's primary responsibility. Now, here's the thing. As General Jim Manish used to say, we are not a life assurance corporation. So I can't promise you you're all going to come back. Oh, and that's man. not really why we're here. Uh, yeah. We're here to do the mission we've been given by the people of the United States, by wow. the president and the commander in chief. So if we're going to do that, uh, the commander's responsibility is, again, to have a plan, to ensure the plan is resourced. And then you got to sell the plan. It's, it's yeah. all about teaching and mentoring. People want to have confidence in the leader that he can actually get them into that and get them out. Everybody knows the odds, especially infantry Marines. They know they know the profession they're in and they know the risks that are inherent to that profession. And so nobody expects 100 percent of everybody to come back every time. What they want to know, though, is you know, you're going to do the best possible job to get them in and get them out. And if, and if someone gets hit and hurt, you're going to get them out. You're not going to leave anybody behind. People want to know that. They'll, they'll fight very hard if they know that, because at the small unit level and even the larger level, people don't fight for the big thing. They don't fight for the flag. They fight for the people around them. They fight for that organization. They're friends. And, and, and it's a very, it's, you know, pe transactional leadership has is, is a, is a, gotten a bad connotation, but there is an element of transactional leadership there. You, gotta, you guys got to go forward and do this work. I'm going to give you the best possible plan to do this work, and I'll get you out. But you got to do what I tell you to do. That point that you made a moment ago, too, about needing to know why and how that's a strategic advantage we have right. with right. Americans fighting forces versus a lot of other, you know, non-democratic fighting forces. Right. I mean, that, that's a very good point that I think a lot of people don't understand. The, the heart of the soldier is or the heart of the Marine, the airman, whatever. It's the unique thing in warfare. It's hard to calculate. That's why uh, the war in Ukraine is developing the way it is. The Ukrainians are fighting. They're fighting for their country. The Russian conscripts are not fighting for anything. And they have very poor leadership. So you got you've got no fighting spirit to begin with, and then you've got very very poor leadership. Their leaders are not doing the things I just described, which is to say, here's our plan. Let me share our plan with you, so you know and understand yeah. it. And then here's how I'm going to supply you. Here's what we're going to do if we get into a pinch. You, the commanders have a responsibility to explain that. The Russian system has never been good at doing it, and it has been uniquely bad at doing it in this current campaign in Ukraine. That's something. You know, another point that you made about leadership is that there's you know, at the initial level, you know, you need to know the job of everyone who's in that particular unit, right? You need to be, and you need to be right. proficient or not best at it. That's right. But it's, but at some point, if a leader is doing a good job, they're going to get promoted to a place where they do have people underneath them. And we think about cybersecurity leadership where you know, there might be a CISO who's really good at risk, but doesn't necessarily understand computer programming at a granular level, the same way somebody who's sitting on the systems and defending it is. How should, you know, is there any advice for how a leader who finds sure. himself? Yeah, so so you ha as, a, as a leader, and particularly a fairly senior leader, you have to have trust in your people. You have to, and they have to, they have to know that you trust them. Um, and there are a couple of ways to do that. One way is this, particularly in the military, but I think it's actually true anywhere, is uh, you've got to be the same way when they give you good information as when they give you bad information. I mean, the negative information. Yeah. So you, what you can't do is be a great guy till they come up and say, oh, it's going off the rails and turn into a raging maniac. You can't do that. <laughs> and here's why. Because people will still have to work for you because they got to, and they'll still have to give you information. But what they will do, nobody likes to be, uh, you know, figuratively slapped in the face. Uh, so they will shade that information 
to try to avoid that. And what you as a leader, particularly in a technical domain like cyber or any one of a number of other domains is you need accurate information. And so people have got to feel I can talk to the boss whether I got good news or bad news. Yeah. So what I used to tell people when I was on active duty was this. I used to be the military secretary to the commandant of the Marine Corps, which is a colonel as the personal assistant to the commandant. I was the director of the joint staff. There's no bad news you can give me that I haven't heard before <laughs> about what human beings do to each other. There's nothing you can tell me. So, but here's the thing. People have got to see that. You can't tell them that. For I, I tell you, every time I've worked for somebody and he said, hey, I'm a great guy. You're going to learn working for me. Unfailingly, that person turned out to be a jerk. <laughs> So, so I don't. So when I when I have a new organization, I don't say I'm a great guy. We're going to get along fine. I say, look, we're going to accomplish the mission here, but we're going to do it in a reasonable manner. And uh, I'm going to look out for your interests, but it has to be demonstrated. You, and all it takes is one one uh, you know getting off your rails once with people, and they remember it. So you've got to be you've got to have relentless personal discipline when it comes to organization. If you when it comes to organizational leadership, does that you know, that's another sort of maybe misconception about military service, or maybe it's right that, you know, the leaders has to be up before everyone else and goes to bed after everyone else. Is that, is that somewhat well, true? I, I'll tell you, that's true. And that's okay. really true of any organization, actually. But, you know, the big thing in the military is you're going to eat last. And the Marine Corps officers eat after everybody else is eating. We eat last. Uh, you know, if you're out on a hike while you, you know, you walk 50 minutes, you take a 10 minute break, you sit down, change your socks. Leaders need to be walking up and down the column, checking other people's feet, making sure their feet are okay. Because in the infantry business, your feet are your means of moving. So it's a critical tool that you got to examine all the time, which means they don't get to check their own feet because they're checking other people's feet. So, yeah, I, I, you expect and require leaders to do that. Now, look, you get to be a four-star general. It's hard to do that because you're, you're removed <laughs> from that. But you still need to find ways to signal it. And, and there, there are ways to do that. Uh, but yeah, it is it is important that, that people down in the you know on the floor working they know and understand their leaders are working hard too, and that you know that is uh, I think it's very important, and I think that is that's often overlooked. And you know you can compensate people, you can pay people well, you can do, and those are important things. Yeah. But people also need to feel that their bosses are in it with them. I'm not going to have you come in on a weekend in an office environment if I'm not willing to do that too. That's right. It's something as That's simple right. as that, right? You're exactly right. Yeah. What, what I got to ask too, like, so for, for all your successes in, in sort of your focus on this, what do you eat for breakfast? Do you, do you have like a special routine for breakfast that you get up? The every day? Crabby right there. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know. Cause I, you know, I, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, in a, when I was in command of central command and, uh, when I was working and, and really now a little bit, I get up, what I'll do is I'll try to PT first thing I'll run or I'll get, get on the Peloton and do something like that. And then I'll fix myself a couple of eggs, um, over easy, a, a low fat bagel, a thin, thin bagel and two pieces of Turkey sausage. And that's what I eat for breakfast. And I do it every morning. And uh, that way I don't have to think about it same way. Now on the weekends, I might, Marilyn and I might do something different. And yeah. I typically fix my wife breakfast when I'm doing that because she does all the other meals, but I'll typically do breakfast. Are you a coffee I, guy too? Or do you a coffee I'm guy? a coffee guy, but I'm okay. a decaf coffee guy. Okay. Went off caffeinated coffee about I go on and off, but I've been off decaf coffee. I've been off caffeinated coffee for about two and a half years now. Yeah. And uh I drink a lot of coffee. I like the taste of coffee, yeah. but I try to drink decaf coffee. And I don't drink any soft drinks at all. And uh okay. but off that I've been off soft drinks for probably 10 years. And uh but, I, but I, that's my routine in the morning. And while I'm eating, I read. And okay. my morning routine is uh, I read the, uh, read the Washington Post. I read the Wall Street Journal. I read the New York Times. I read the Tampa Bay Times. Um, I used to read USA Today. I, I, I dip in and out of that. I read Financial Times, all electronically. Everything's electronic. Oh, wow. I, read all those, I try to read all those journals every day. And then every week I read uh, The Economist which is the best news magazine in the world and maybe the best magazine in the world. Yeah. And then the second best magazine in the world is the New Yorker. And I read the New Yorker religiously. Um, I read Harper's every month. I read the Atlantic every month. Um, wow. And the magazine I just stopped because I've, I've had, I had a subscription since high school is Rolling Stone. 
<laughs> I've followed. I've read Rolling Stone through good times and bad. That's awesome. And I tell you, it, it's just moved beyond its roots so much now yeah. that it's not worth it. I, even the music articles have they're like written by aliens. It's hard, you know, yeah, it's hard it used to, to be eighty percent, ninety percent music, yeah, and right. now then it became movies. Right. And now it's politics. It right. just got it's so politics far. And, yeah, you yeah. know, I liked it. Really, you know, I can remember when it was in a paper, it came like a newspaper, you know, and back in the good old days. And I, I've read, but I've read it since high school. I just cut my subscription like yeah. last month because I tell you, I just don't find it interesting. Yeah. And, I, and I, I've got a limit. The big, the, you know, the big thing about being a senior leader in any organization is it's time. What do you do with your time? Yeah. Because you can, you can change any resource you have except time. That's the one thing that affects us all equally. Reason, you know, money, um, all kinds of other things. You can add more, you can take it away. But what you can't do is you can't modify time. And so I'm very conscious of how I spend my time. Did you, on your way up, did you have mentors? Is there anybody who stands out as a really powerful mentor for you? The first is a woman named Michelle Flournoy. She's, uh, she was the former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. I worked for her as a fellow 1999 2000 at the international at the institute for national strategic studies at the national defense university and she was uh, and what we did was well, she got a small group of people together to take a look at the quadrennial defense review we don't do it anymore but it used to be a four-year study of uh, of the state of the military made recommendations it was a pretty big deal several years ago and so she uh, i was exposed to her for 18 months and i, I would tell you she was brilliant and uh, demanding, strong leader. And a, a lot of my views about higher level policy strategy were directly informed by my interaction with her. Oh, wow. So she's been very, very, very formative uh, in, my, in, my, in my career outside the Marine Corps. And, and we, we stay in touch to this day. And uh, she's, just a, she's just a wonderful person. I can't say no good things about Michelle. So she's, she's been very important to me. Look, inside the Marine Corps, there are a number of uh, you know, a number of Marine generals, colonels, too many to name here, yeah. all of whom that, that uh, you know, took me under their wing, shared, shared stuff with me. And, and mentoring is a very important part of being an officer. You know, people know, you know just a fact, people know who, who your mentors are. They know, yeah. uh, you know, they sort of know your track record as a result of that. So it's an important thing. We need to do better at that in the Marine Corps and across all the services, actually, and making that more available to everybody, not just people that look like me. But, uh, you know, but to, yeah. but, but to women, uh, to yeah. other minorities, and my service, the Marine Corps, has struggled with that. We don't have it solved, but I can tell you this, they do recognize it's a problem. And, yeah. I, and I've taken, I've, one of the things I've been very conscious of doing when I mentor people is I'm looking for, I'm looking to, to be very broad and diverse in my approach to that. Yeah. Is, is there like, um, another thing too, like sometimes you hear about leaders in business community or, or in government might say, you know, I really want to stay in touch with people, but I'm too busy. I lose track, right? But, you know, no one's busier than a general. I mean, no one's yeah. busier than you, right? How did you, over the years, how did you stay in touch with people? Do you, do you do phone calls? Do you try to see them? How do you stay in touch? So email actually helps a lot. Okay. Email, um, you know, I do Facebook, but I do Facebook actually very narrowly, mainly family. Okay. Once I retired, I've gotten into LinkedIn. And okay. I never did LinkedIn on active duty or reasons why I didn't do that. Yeah. But now that I'm retired, I'm actually pretty, I'm a lot more open to contacts on LinkedIn than I am on Facebook. But, you know, I, I'll tell you, I, I um, try to stay in touch with phone calls, messages, not letters so much anymore yeah. uh, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, I, you know, and I would tell you, that's something I need to do better at. Okay. I need to do better, but I, I will always tell people, you know, shoot me an email and I, I never, I never, you know, mind getting an email from somebody. It may take me a while to answer it, and uh, <laughs> but I'll try to do that. But it's, you're right. You hit on a key thing. It's important to stay in touch. It's very important to do that. I heard about a concept the other day called email bankruptcy, which is the idea that I'm just going to write an email to all my contacts saying, I'm very sorry. I've been busy. I haven't written you guys back. Please don't be offended. I'm declaring email bankruptcy. If you want my attention, all new emails from this day forward. I will do my out. best to respond to it. We're starting new right here. This is it. Starting fresh. I'm doing it. Email bank. Well, you know, well, that's a thought. I'm going to file that one away. <laughs> that's, a, yeah, that's a good tip. Um, but you you had a master's degree in teaching, I think. Yeah. That's something that I think was surprising when we saw about you. How have you used that in your career? Okay. So uh, yeah. when I was a young captain, um, lieutenant captain, I actually was assigned to the Marine Barracks Charleston. 
It, it doesn't exist anymore. It used okay. to be a naval weapons station there, a big Navy base, nuclear submarine base, and the Marine Corps provided security for it. After my first overseas assignment in Okinawa, I came back. So I was in Charleston, lived there for three years as a, as a second lieutenant, first lieutenant, and a brand new captain. And so I had the opportunity to go back to school at night in the Citadel's there. Oh, wow. obviously. And so the yeah. Citadel has a night program that's unrelated to the Corps cadets and all the military stuff. It just, what it does is it principally served, you know, the local community for teachers that wanted to get, you know, that wanted to pursue degrees. So at the time, this is 19, early 1980s, the only master's program they had was an MAT, a Master of Arts in Teaching. So I was there, I wanted to get a master's degree. So I got into that that's program awesome. at night. But you get the concentrations in history, but I never regretted that. Um, and so I went on and actually my next assignment get this right my next assignment after well two assignments down the road i was at the virginia military institute and i was able to teach there and uh actually won the junior professor teaching award the thomas oh, Jefferson wow. teaching award and I, I enjoy teaching i enjoy being in the classroom i enjoy I, again it's this it goes back it's a central theme i like being around people i like talking to people and uh, and it was very that was another very rewarding experience at, at the virginia military institute what and that's a big, big part of teaching at the higher education level is not just learning how to teach, but also learning how other people learn. That's correct. You, you have to be you have to be sensitive to different learning styles. And, you know, it'll be obvious to you. Some people are visual learners. Some people have to listen. Some people need to read, um, you know, and some for some it's a combination of all three. And uh, but you're right. You have to be you have to be sensitive to that. So, you know, you spend three years teaching undergraduates at the freshman or sophomore level and you, you gain an appreciation for that and I and it, it was very helpful to me also to be back around young people even younger people than many marines during that period of time and from 88 to 1991 that's what I did I also coached football there and that was very rewarding also <laughs> yeah, you think about too like how many football coaches you know high schools or, co or colleges across the country at least before the professionalization of that were teachers who that's were right. also football coaches right Look, so coaching you football doing... coaching football is teaching you got to teach. You got to be able to teach, just like anything else. If you're inarticulate uh, as a as a as a teacher and you're coaching, it's going to be hard to get your message across. And people, again, it's like it's like any other discipline. They've got to believe you got a path to success, and you got to teach them. And uh, and so it, you know, coaching, whether it's football, basketball, name the sport, yeah. it is in fact all about conveying a message mm -hmm. and getting buy-in from the people you're talking to. Do you have a professional football team that you that you root for? So I'm a big Bucks fan. Okay, I'm a recovering Washington football team. Washington, <laughs> uh, but I'm a Bucks fan. Yeah, and, and it's easy to like the Bucks because it's a good organization. Yeah. They're good people. The, the fan, you know, the owners are good. I think they try to do a lot of good things in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, you know, and of course, you know they're 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 winning. And they were last year. We'll see what they do this year. Uh, but I think. Uh, but I think it's just a good organization. So it's an easy, you know, it's an easy professional team to follow. And so I really um, grew up in Alabama. So professional football is not a big thing <laughs> in the state of Alabama. Well, it is, except it's college professional football. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, in Alabama, you're either an Auburn or an Alabama person. So okay. my family are Auburn people. And, uh, but, but the state of Alabama has never really been penetrated by loyalties to external professional football teams. Atlanta never was a big factor in Alabama and St. Louis and New Orleans New has never Orleans, been a big yeah. factor. It's not because you got Auburn, Alabama there and other teams now as well, such as the University of Alabama, Birmingham. If you, knowing all you know about leadership and having coached football, can you, like when you're watching a football game now, can you relax or are you on thinking about what you would do, thinking about how you would change tactics? So I, I just, I like to watch the technical game. Given a choice, I'd watch the 22 man view. You know what I'm talking about? Yep, I, zoom down. You see, yeah. I hate it when they zoom down. You can't see what the free safety is doing, what the cornerback's <laughs> doing. So I like watching that. I like listening to the technical side of it. I can take or leave the commentary you yeah. know, from the uh, from the broadcasters. I mean, I get emotional about Auburn football when they play because I have much of my life's been associated with following them for good or bad. I'm a lot more, uh, I'm a lot more uh, clinical or detached with professional football because the game is different. I mean, college football is a game of mismatch, a uh, big mismatch where you've got to be artistic and find a way to compensate for market inferiority. Professional football, it is a game of mismatch as well, yeah. but, the new, but the degree of mismatch is so infinitesimally small that it's, uh, that it's unless, and, and here's the other thing, unless you spend time looking at video, it's hard to know why a coach does what he does. So when yeah. people criticize coaches, I'm always sensitive to the fact that they put hundreds of hours of study in 
to make that decision. Doesn't mean it wasn't still a mistake, but you know, they looked at it as a reason because what you don't want to do is come up with it on the sideline. You know, you've thought about it all week. You know yeah. what you want to do in this situation. So you call the play and run it. Yeah. And they're not getting like the idea that they're, I love the idea of the armchair, you know, guy washing at home who say, oh, they, it was obvious they should have been in a cover two. Yeah, yeah they, that's they, right. What are you, I, what are you talking I, about? I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> agree more. It's very easy to be critical. And, you know, so, I mean, look, all coaches are compensated. So it comes with the territory. Uh, but you're right. It's, it's like people, you know, most people don't realize the incredible amount of work that goes into prep a team to play. And just oh. the intellectual, the intellectual uh, investment in the game plan, in, in, in the coaching, and the teaching, and the, sch- the scheming to get ready to play a game. You've worked with Marines. And you've been in all manner of roles. And then sometimes you hear folks describe a football game as war or battle, or these are my soldiers, right? How do you feel when you hear that? Are you okay yeah, so, with that? Or is it weird? Um, it, it's, it, it's okay. I mean, yeah. look, okay. you know, so it's not war because nobody's getting killed. Uh, and that's sort of the, that's, you know, that's, that's, yeah. that's a key thing, but it, it but it, it's, uh, it's always had that attachment. I mean, historically going back to roots of the origins of football in the United States, yeah. there was a, the, the earliest NCAA involvement in football was to inculcate young men with more warlike qualities. They were feared okay. that we were becoming too soft. And uh, so, you know, football is an interesting oh, approach wow. to this, but we should never confuse football with war. It's a, it's a fun thing. You know, we're going to walk away though. We're going to play a game next week. So it's, it's, but it's very different. So I, I typically don't tend to use that analogy, um, okay. but I don't, I don't begrudge someone who does use okay. that. What, and just, uh, you know, we're going to do some fun stuff in a minute here, but I wanted to just get what, one more perspective from you sure. on, you know, in the time that you were in um, in service and then now uh, working with Cyber Florida, like what have you seen as how technology, particularly cyber warfare, but technology generally has transformed or changed combat? So c- cyber considerations and what we call the cyber domain, the cyber universe that's out there, the vast internet, the, the, there's, a, there's an old saying, the internet is vast and infinite. And the internet is vast and infinite because the internet maps the human, maps the human terrain. And it is practically infinite. So from when I came in the Marine Corps in 1979 uh, until now, it has revolutionized everything. As a, as a combatant commander, when I thought about anything, I began by thinking about cyber. Cyber is an element of our plan. Cyber is an element of a potential enemy's plan, how it could affect us how we might want to affect them, the merging of cyber effects, which is what things happen, things that happen on the battlefield, cyber effects, kinetic, non-kinetic effects, all of those things. It has revolutionized warfare, and we are in that revolution is continuing. We have not yet seen the final thing. I'll put it in perspective like this. There are two new domains that we study in the military, space and cyber, okay? So I believe cyber is actually more demanding and more infinite than space. Hmm. People would disagree with me on that, but that's just my opinion. Space, at least for right now, we're talking, you know, low Earth orbit, high Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit, says lunar space, all of that, that's that's a problem. But but the, the cyber is actually, I believe, more difficult to quantify and understand. Yeah, we're going to be using cybersecurity resources to communicate with any sort of satellites or, or that's uh, right. And the, the, right. the two, and the two domains are linked. <laughs> the United States is absolutely without our satellite constellation, we would be to, to use a fr- in the heart locker. We got to have the satellite constellation mm-hmm. and we are very vulnerable. The United States has the most powerful offensive cyber capabilities in the world. What we can do is eye watering. We also have a glass jaw we are the most vulnerable society in the world to cyber attack because of the ubiquity of the systems in the United States, because everything, everything runs off that backbone, everything. And it's open and it's not, you know, there are no really good national policies. So that's an issue. And, and that's why, that's why the work is so interesting in cyber Florida. That's right. You think about, you know, the power goes out in the Tampa Bay region and people's watches stop working. You know, right. whatever happened to a, you know, right. you should have a wind up watch that's and now everybody's that's got right. a watch that needs to get recharged. You're like, you have to have a working watch guys. Come on, let's think about redundancy. But we should be, we should be very concerned about that. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, thank you very much. We're going to take a short break now. And when we return, we'll have Ernie's lifestyle polygraph. So stay with us. You're listening to the no password required podcast. We cover cybersecurity and a lot of other stuff. 
Okay, welcome back. General McKenzie, as you may be aware, the lifestyle polygraph is issued to members of the intelligence community to determine their suitability to have access to some of the nation's greatest secrets. However, here on No Password Required, we have our own version of it, uh, mostly so that we can uh, just find out what people, uh, what, what makes people tick. So we've got a series of questions, five questions um, that are going to uh, kind of, you know, you talked a lot about, uh, you know, how you got where you are and who's influenced you and, uh, and your thinking, but uh, we're going to, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper now. So, sir, are you ready for the lifestyle polygraph? I'm ready, Aaron. Go ahead. Start Here your questions. Go. Question number one. Question number one. Uh, what is something that you already miss about military life? I think what I miss the most about military life um, in the latter part of my career anyway, is the, uh, your mainlining knowledge. Mm. You're, you're fed with the best information in the world all day. Um, you know, just about everything going on. Uh, and so you have a very good sense of what's going on behind the headlines um, all, everywhere in the world. And that, that actually is addictive. It's profoundly addictive. And, uh, and so when you leave, well, for a guy like me, around mid-afternoon on the last day of March, it cut uh, or one April, it cut off, and that went away. Yeah, they cold wow. turkey. Yeah. So now, now I'm reading the Economist, and uh, <laughs> which is a which is a very good magazine. But you know, I'm not reading the PD, the uh, President's Daily uh, Briefing wow. anymore, and all the other things that really sort of give you, uh, you know, behind the behind the curtain. I miss that. Um, uh, you know, and, and the other thing I would just say, and I miss the people. Uh, more pr probably deeply just you know you're always you're always in a group of people that you work with you feel that you're working toward a common and important goal a good goal a noble goal and you sort of miss that and that that's probably the biggest thing and so you, you sort of wander around a little bit and uh because it, it's very sudden it's abrupt because when you're a combatant commander you go from 100 100 percent to zero percent wow. in the course of an afternoon and so that's that's a pretty significant change what it's a silly point, but like, what about uniform? Like you didn't, you know, if you're wearing a uniform and you're on service, you don't have to worry about what to wear in the morning. Did you have to go buy a bunch of clothes? No. So by the time you're a, uh, a co-com and you okay. know, I, I got, <laughs> okay. I got no shortage of civilian clothes. All right. uh, that, you know, that's a great point, but, but it is, you know, so you do have to, you have to decide, you know, what you're going to wear to work every day, which was never a problem before, but actually <laughs> most, most guys that retire about what I have, I mean, you, you're, you're yeah. you know, you've got tons of clothes. So I, not, I mean, having it's not a problem. Picking it is, but luckily, I've got my wife who advises me pretty aggressively on what I need to wear. <laughs> well, and I got to tell you, sir, you it, you've been a pretty snappy dresser. I got to tell you, you, you know, you're not uh, you're not hurting in that space. I mean, that's that's pretty good. Well, it's not me; it's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> my wife only has veto power. It's only that she's not helpful. She doesn't help me. It's only telling me what I can't. Uh, right. And you and, can't go out the door looking like that. And I think most days, Jack, you just walk, you, you try to sneak out ahead of that. that uh, That's that why I get up early. It's not personal motivation. It's the way I can escape the uh, without having to be told. But when I, when I worked for the government, I wore a suit every day. I just had five suits and you just rotated. And it was easy. White shirt, five suits, you're good. And then when I left, someone told me about business casual. And I was like, wait a minute, what? I have to buy khakis now? What is this about? So I just bought five pairs of pants, five new shirts. It's good to go. So just repeated it. <laughs> okay, here we are. Question number two. Question number two, moving on. What is your favorite board game? So my favorite board game is going to be hard to actually describe because my, my primary hobby is the collection of war games from the 70s, 80s, and beyond. So I've got a collection of several hundred games, um, including um, I mean, some of you may recall a company named Avalon Hill. Absolutely. Put out a lot of games. Yes, Simulations sir. Publications Incorporated that put out a lot of games. GDW, on and on. I could name the alphabet soup of game uh, producers that, that, that made these games. So I, I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of games. And it, but I would say this, it would be a, uh, it would be a conflict simulation game. It wouldn't be a game like Monopoly, which is a perfectly fine game or, or Risk or something like that. Uh, but but it's a good game. I will tell you a game that sort of catches my attention. It's hard to play because it's hard to get everybody together. Is a game called Diplomacy. 
It's about uh, diplomacy. That was a great one. We did uh, that one and uh, uh, Kingmaker was the other one that we Kingmaker used to is play. very good too. The yeah. War of the Roses. Uh, yeah. The, 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 I put I put Kingmaker in there as well. Good games. I enjoy them. You know, the, the, the problem is for it's hard to find somebody to play them. Really, for diplomacy, you need five people. And uh, there have been some there's been some computer simulations out there that have tried to work diplomacy. Not very well. It really is something best played, you know, sort of person to person. But I I, I enjoy games. Uh, I collect them. I don't get much of a chance to play them now. Now, is that game, uh, is that the one you're, uh, when you play, you're most competitive with? Is that? Uh, I was pretty good at it. Yeah. I was pretty good at it. it requir- you know, it requires ability to read people, know and understand people. Because, you know, diplomacy is, uh, there's not a lot of chance in diplomacy. It really is relationships among the, among the players of the game that you sort of negotiate. What was the other one? Oh, Air Assault on Crete. That was That's the other, a good game with the uh, with, with the with the Malta uh, option as well. Right with the Malta <laughs> with the Malta add-on at the yes. back end of that. Yeah, that's a very good game. That's yeah. a very good game. Yeah. A lot that's of a lot good. of good games, and that that of course is a game from the seventies, late seventies, yep. uh, which was sort of the heyday of board war gaming, and then it fell off in the eighties, nineties, and it's in a renaissance now. As yeah. we speak right now, there are a number of very good publishers out there that are making very good war games. The problem is the games today tend to be highly complex, yeah. much more complex than the games of the 70s and 80s, you know, 100 to 200 page rule books. So it's, it's quite an effort. If you want to you want to get into one of those games, you've got to invest the, the time uh, to, to learn the system. It's something where like um, Kickstarter has really helped with that, because it, you, if you have a cool yes. idea, you can yes. take in. You don't need a lot. Right. Just take enough to just put together a couple of prototypes That's right. and then and you can give them out. So it's kind of neat to see. I mean, that even that section of like a main, like a store like Target has gotten bigger. You know, strategy gaming has gotten bigger even in mainstream yep. stores mm-hmm. as a result. I think of, of these games yeah. that, hard-based games that started um, yep. Through, yep. through crowdfunding. No, no you're right. And, the, and the, for the company, the, the big game companies like GMT today or MMP, the runs of games are fairly small. So because they've learned the hard way from SPI, which made a lot of games and couldn't sell them. Even though they sold a lot of games, they sort of killed themselves with their business model. The companies now are very attuned to, you know, how to, how, you know, Kickstarter, how many people signed up for it. And you have to sign up. I, I bet I'm signed up to buy 20 or 30 games right now that are in various stages of publication. And I'll be billed when they ship it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Speaking of being billed when they ship, this has, that's a horrible segue, but we're going to go with it. <clears throat> what has Hollywood gotten wrong? And write about being a Marine. <laughs> Gunny Highway, right? Uh, no, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would tell you, uh, you know, so what, what Hollywood largely gets wrong is it's hyperbole. Um, you know, everybody, I mean, you know, everyone's crying or shouting and screaming. And in reality, most uh, Marines, particularly in difficult situations, tend to be pretty flat and direct. And, uh, and pretty transactional. So, you know, there's not a lot of the stuff you see in Hollywood. Uh, you know, there are some okay war movies out there. There aren't many okay war movies. I mean, I think um, I was always a fan of Sam Peckinpah's Cross of Iron. Um, yes, yes. With, uh, just uh, in Yugoslavia. Uh, uh, James you know, Coburn. Coburn. James Coburn, Maximilian Schell. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's a, that movie is from 1976, I believe. Pretty good movie. Uh, it sort of captured the essence. I think a small unit, small unit fighting. Probably not a politically correct movie today, but but it, nonetheless, it, it was it was a very good it was a very good film. Um, you know, I, I think it's hard to it's hard to do because you need to manufacture drama, you need to grant, manufacture emotion, and uh, I work most of my life trying to reduce drama and reduce emotion. Uh, you know, from from decision making and from tactical situations. You know, it, I mean, look, it's there because people are getting hurt and that's a very emotional situation. But there's not a lot of not a lot of people making Henry the Fifth speeches. If they stand up for them, they're probably going to get shot. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's just it's a very different the modern battlefield. And by the modern battlefield, I really mean World War Two on is just very different. It's a lot. Uh, it's a lot flatter. So I, and I think Hollywood gets a lot wrong. And uh, and, you know, they're always, you know, pushing a message overt or covert about, you know, what they want you to take away from it. And so I tend to watch movies like that uh, for, not for the main theme of the movie, but there might be some particular element of it that I like. Uh, not a lot, though. 
I, I, I just, uh, it just recently came out on Netflix, but it's the remake of All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, the remake? Yes. Oh. Uh, it's a, it, a, a German, German producers made it. And I, I, uh, it's, it's pretty powerful. I mean, I, it's, it, it uh, is, it is pretty powerful, but it, it's yeah. really from the German angle. Yes. Yes. Uh, so yes, it does. Exactly. It's the equivalent of Das Boot. Yes. Which is uh, the side of the yep. U-boat World War II, uh, which is, again, made as a, Das Boot is an excellent movie. You can buy it now with either English uh, subtitles or dubbed English. But the, the best way to watch a German movie, actually, is to watch it in German with subtitles. Yep. Because you get the harsh, to get the language. Uh, yeah. Another great movie, I would tell you, it's not really, so it's sort of a war movie. The German movie is Downfall. About the yes, of yeah, the last days of Hitler. That yes, is, that's another German movie. I found that to be better than, uh, I think, more accurate philosophically to the problems of the German regime than, uh, you know, than, than either Das Boot or uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. Yeah, that, yeah. Movie. yeah. And those, I, they, for those like the Das Boot, you really get, and the on All Quiet, uh, you get that sense of it from the, I call it the, the soldier sailors perspective and it kind of that, that's a that's a very strong part of yeah. both those films yep. yeah I couldn't agree whereas the down the downfall what that's you get really get a at least a, you you can see and and get an appreciation for what the at that point in time what the what the problems the uh yeah the germans were, were facing which and then of course the the guy the guy driving the train for the germans how he was kind of off the rails pun intended yes so speaking of off the rails, again, another pointless uh, segue. Why? And now this this is gonna this is a almost a a, a partisan question, and uh, it could it, it this is a polarizing topic here with our fan base. Why is Star Trek superior to Star Wars? Well, that's immediately obvious. <laughs> I mean, star, I mean, if you have to ask that question. <laughs> you know, I would, I'd actually wonder about your basic understanding of what the two what the two genres try to do. I mean, look, so so Star Trek, it's uh, it's an attempt by uh, by people of goodwill to impose order on the universe, and so because as you know, when bad men combine, good men must associate, and that's the heart of Star Trek. You know, they don't get it right all the time, but they're, they're trying to do the right thing, and so. That to me, uh, it's a very clear, uh, it's a very clear story, and uh, and I think it's a very, it's a very important story, you know. Whereas Star Wars, it's uh, it's a little more complex, and, and and it's difficult to actually determine who the good guys are there at different times, uh, because they're not. The, the, let me back up a second. Star Trek's actually, I think, better fleshed out in terms of its arc of the story. Mm -hmm. Star Wars, despite all the movies that have been made, all the spinoffs. It's much more, it's much less fleshed out, at least to me. I just prefer, I just, you know, so I prefer Star Trek. Now, my sister is a huge Star Wars nut, and I infuriate her all the time <laughs> by, you know, by, you see the new Star Trek movie? What about Star Trek 8? You know, I mean, you know, she, she, you know, she, she has trouble dealing with that because she's a, she's a real Star Wars person. And I, and I respect those people flawed as they are. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was also like uh, Star Wars has which I love you know I love both of them and I yeah. uh, but Star Trek was trying to do something it was trying to make a point a political point right and Star yeah. Wars was fun, was supposed to be fun and then they've gone back and tried to make it as if it had a yeah. point right, That's right. yeah That's so one right. is one had a perspective and the other didn't and Star Wars ultimately like it's about certain people are just gifted with this. With, with the, the force, force. yeah, and it's like yeah. becomes like a genetic right. thing almost. Like that's right. What is everybody supposed to do? And uh, whereas Star Trek was about Plus, good bureaucracy, you, the, yeah, yeah. The standard, the standard of small arms shooting by the Empire in Star Wars. I mean, yeah. truly, it's horrific. I yeah, mean, it's almost like the eighteen. Never hit anything. All these guys, the Imperial stormtroopers, they can't do anything right. Plus, <laughs> the, the, the Imperial space building program, the Death Star. Holy cow, they can never get that thing together. They're always behind budget and it's very vulnerable. I mean, you would think, you know, for an empire that builds those star destroyers, they would have figured out that maybe the Death Star is not the way to go. At least <laughs> but they did it twice. It, let's get it, let's get it finished before we rush it off into combat. Right. So I, I, I question their basic space building plan, the concepts behind it. You know, the empire just never seems to learn. <laughs> Yeah, the, the idea that yeah, their bureaucracy was poor because they were not investing in good like middle management training. 
That's correct. Right. Yeah. right. That's and we're correct. not. And Vader, we're you know, if he sees somebody in lock, he chokes the guy to death. <laughs> so, yeah, that's really going to, that really motivates, you know, feel great officers. Well, right. Talk right. about it, overreacting to bad news. It, it, that's exactly yeah, correct. It's a classic example. Yeah. Now, all those guys, you know, they, they kill the guy that brings them bad news. Well, that's not going to, that's not going to make them bring it the right news. It's going to make them try to cover it up. Hey, Kirk would probably say, you know, I, I got to think of an instance where he did it, but he probably would have said, thank you for bringing this to me. This gives us enough time right. to come up with a solution. I don't, I I don't remember James T. Kirk killing anybody on the bridge because they gave him bad news. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying. No, I, but he would say something to the effect of I'm responsible for the lives of 325 members. His of only problem, <laughs> we were, we were watching this the other day. It was I don't know if it was one or two, but his only problem was he, in mean, the movies, I don't know about the show less, but he was always put himself on the away team. Yeah, yeah, the captain. Right. Yeah, Stop putting yeah. yourself on the away team. Like there are others, right. you might be good in. Well, what you didn't want to do, what, what you didn't want to do, was to be one of the security guys that went down on the away team. Exactly. Yeah, they yeah. infallibly died. Uh, exactly. Well, exactly. Every time. Yeah. Every time they got killed. They got killed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The only so guy... real question, Ernie, and I'm surprised you didn't ask it. Is it Star Trek or Picard in the new Star Trek? Ooh. Yeah, that's the right. real question. And so, again, everyone knows it's the old Star Trek. The original. It's not the new Star Trek. The new Star Trek is nothing but a common, uh, but a great bundle of weakness. A great bundle of weakness. Wow. So, now so speaking of the new, the the old, what about the way that they've re? I call it rebooted Star Trek with the movies. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That in one of these, the new movies with Chris Pine as right. Captain Kirk. They basically, they travel through time or they reset the entire sequence by I don't know, setting off a black hole, uh, a singularity right. near something. There's always a black hole nearby when you need one. <laughs> well, exactly right. I, I think we've got one here, at least. Next to the, yeah. Uh, but so really, so, uh, but when you say that, I know there's different, I'll call it Star Trek. So actually, so, I love. I like the I like the Chris Pine story. Chris Pine, I, okay. I like that. I don't like the uh, Jean Luc Picard. The, yeah, the Next Generation uh, crew. The Next Generation. Uh, yeah, and that's the there's... bundle. Of, that's the great bundle of weaknesses lumbering around the universe. Uh, <laughs> you know, Pine is good. Star Trek One's good. It's the guys in the middle that are weak. Yeah. What about what is, uh, what is it? Deep Space Nine? Is that still or any you know, of those? Deep Babylon Five. Are there a lot yeah. of? I'll, you know, I've got to be honest with you. I haven't seen it, but I have watched the new. Uh, there's a new net, net. There's a new Star Trek show out called Brave New Worlds. I think one season with uh, set before, hmm. and that's actually quite good. It's set right before Kirk came along. That's right. It, it is actually, it's actually pretty good. I'm trying to remember the captain's name, who was the guy before Kirk, because they have he. I think he was in the pilot episode. Admiral. Was. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, oh man, I don't think. Yeah. That. But yeah. I, I do yeah. say that I, the pilot is, is, yeah, it's a it's different not, it's captain. Not captain Kirk. It is. It is. He starts You're right. Again. You're right. But, and and I have to say that uh, I learned everything I know about self-defense from Captain Kirk uh, because there is no move that can be that you there's no blocking for the clavicle chop. And then, once you do that, I mean, it's, it's, it goes from there. And then uh, and, and your hair comes right back and you're. You, you can have a ripped shirt, but it, it repairs itself. It's fantastic. That's right. That's right. Fantastic. All right. Here we are. Number five. Uh, you know, we're going to be, you, we're journey, journeying through space. Segways into a, a long tour overseas. What is the meal you most craved when you returned to the United States? What's the meal that you missed the most and that you wanted when you came back from a long, from deployment? Um. That's a good question, Ernie. Uh, it was actually, I, I, I've never had a problem eating while deployed. You, you, know, you know what I'm saying? The food's usually pretty good because you leave on a ship, you come back on the ship. And so you're eating pretty good on the ship. Yeah. So it's not like you're missing food. Um, <laughs> good. Uh, you know, um, I would tell you, I, I'll put it to you like this. I don't mean to be modeling. Any meal I could eat with my wife. Oh, there you go. That's excellent. Yeah. Yes. I pull yeah. that one from the jaws of disaster. That's uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, big salad. Is, the real big question salad. you should have asked is, what's your what's the best meal to eat if you're in the field, in you know, in a tactical situation? And everybody knows the answer to that, of course, is beef enchiladas. Beef enchiladas. Really? When I was in when I was in Afghanistan as a new commander uh, for four months, and then uh, then, in, then then in Iraq later, when we were in the field forward, 
I ate one meal a day and it was beef enchilada. I never right. ate anything but a beef enchilada meal. So and really, we made that the only meal in the MRE. We could have won those wars in half the time. <laughs> you think so? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, now the question, I, I don't remember. Did that meal come with the, the jalapeno cheese or just it regular? It did. It came yeah, with jalapeno see. cheese, crackers. Came yeah. with the, you know, with that, with that, it came, we came with the, the, you know, the entree itself and it came with, uh, came with a powdered, you know, with a powdered uh, Kool-Aid powder. Yeah. You could either eat directly or mix if you, if you showed like, but I tell you, I ate one of those a day and nothing else. Yeah. Wow. I was in the field yeah. and, uh, and there's nothing better than a beef and, and, and with a little Tabasco sauce, nothing better than a beef enchilada. That's the meal of champions. I want to say there's probably only one of those in the case of MREs. Uh, now, it, was there ever a time where you had to, you know, you had to take the rank off and get to, to, to wrestle for it? Or was it just kind of, oh, hey, the general likes the beef enchiladas? Or, I mean, like, did Sergeant uh, Major come in and say, hey, it, sir, usually, it usually worked out. Someone handed me a beef enchilada. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. Good, good to know. So we'll have to make sure we start finding. You know, a lot of people don't like beef enchiladas, though. Well, it's not a universal favorite. They, well, it does it, but I don't think it falls in the same as, uh, what was it, uh, tuna casserole. That was always like a, oh, that's yeah, like a, yeah, yeah, you're right. Tuna casserole was uniquely bad. Yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> it, you know, and then, um, the, the, I will say the newer MREs were actually pretty darn good compared they're to, very good. yeah, very we good. had the, uh, they're excellent. They're excellent. Yeah, the, uh, it was, we called the hot dogs was, uh, we called them the finger, the four fingers of death. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and then you had the, uh, uh, it, it was the oatmeal bar. That was, that was almost like a sharpening stone. It was, yeah, the oatmeal same bar. you're right you're right that you know gosh you're, you're, you're exactly right and that then and, and there was a can i forget what the candy was charms it was a cookie i think in the in the uh it was a, it was a, it, was a, it was a cookie in the uh in the beef enchilada sugar cookie or yeah something like that that was the dessert yep yeah and i remember like charms you never you didn't eat the charms they were bad luck in this period of time yeah you you better drink a lot of water when you, yeah, <laughs> when yeah. you were oh, eating yeah. that oh, stuff yeah. too that's right you're right you're right yeah you're right. that was uh but uh well, so that brings us to the end of uh, end of our uh, end of our show here. Uh, and so, General, thank you very much for uh, for joining us. This has really been uh, fantastic. Uh, and uh, if our listeners could connect with, uh, with with you in Cyber Florida, how would they do that? Well, there are a lot of ways. Uh, we have a website, and there I would encourage them to come to the website and uh, and enter through there. And Ernie, why don't you provide the uh, why don't you provide the information on that? Uh, absolutely, www.cyberflorida.org. Uh, and that is a that is a great way to get in touch with me. And I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to talk to anyone that would like to that would like to reach out. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, General. This has been really fantastic. It's been my pleasure. I've enjoyed working with Ali. I have a great uh, have a great holiday season, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, General. Okay, that brings us to the end of our program, and thank you for joining us. First and foremost, I have to thank my co-host, Jack Clabby, and a special thank you to our guest, General McKenzie. He's a senior leader who shows us that even though you might read Rolling Stone magazine, you can still reach the heights of any profession. So that said, let's remember to rate, review, and subscribe to No Password Required Podcast. You can find us on social media at No Password Pod. And if you'd like some show swag, just ask and we'll hook you up. I'm Ernie Ferrasso. Thank you for listening and we'll talk again soon. Thank you for listening to the No Password Required podcast. The show is produced by Cyber Florida. A special thanks goes out to our friends at Carlton Fields and Second Watch. If you would like to learn more about the show, visit our website at cyberflorida.org slash pod. And if you still need more show content, check out our social media at no password pod.